CYC is a free channel presents the Word of God for everyone. Your support will help us to continue the mission. Visit our website, cycnow.com. Even a dollar will make a difference. Hello, and welcome back to our second season of CYC MD. Previously, if you recall, we were visited with many different and various healthcare professionals and providers who gave us an insight into their careers, as well as their schooling and education. In this new and exciting season, we are indulging and digging and focusing in more on their area of expertise. Today, we will be touching on the topic that many of us tend to have an issue with, especially as Egyptians who love food and who love to eat, which is cholesterol. With me today, I'd like to welcome again our cardiologist, uh, Dr. Amged Makarius, who is the Chief Cardiologist at Nassau University Medical Center. Welcome. Pleasure to have you. Thank you. So, the topic of cholesterol. Every time somebody says the word cholesterol, it's almost that like, you know, everybody cringes like, oh, I got that. <laughs> so, what is cholesterol? And, I mean, touch over the fact that it's also, it is something that's necessary, but only in the right quantity. So what is cholesterol? So cholesterol is really the way that our body um, contains the blood, uh, the, contains the cholesterol, actually, the fatty substances within our blood. And that's the cholesterol particle that we talk about. Now there are different cholesterol partic particles, which we'll get to uh, in a second. But in general, fat is actually needed for the body. It helps make up uh, different components of our cells, whether in our brain, whether in you know all mm -hmm. parts of the body, so fat is a necessary is a necessary thing in the body. However, the problem becomes when we get too much of the fat, and it thereby then deposits in different areas of the body and different blood vessels and causes a problem. Exactly. So that's the general idea. So, and I know we touched over this in our last episode. Um, we touched over the components that make up cholesterol, and you talked over uh, such things as LDL, which you said was the bad cholesterol, and HDL, and triglycerides. I'm just gonna ask you to revisit it and to just um, r remind us what were the normal levels for each of those, and then the normal level for just the overall uh, cholesterol value. Right. So we talk about different components of the actual cholesterol itself. And when we talk about the different cholesterols, the, the total cholesterol is made up of all these different particles. And we talk about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. The bad cholesterol is the LDL, or the low density type of cholesterol. And this is the type of cholesterol which can cause more problems if you have a high level of it. Then there are the, the high density uh, cholesterol. And that cholesterol, if we see on this chart here, is the good cholesterol, because what that does is it stores the actual components of the cholesterol in a different form, which is actually better to have higher levels of. So let's talk about these actual levels. The total cholesterol is the number that most people are actually familiar with. And if you look at this chart here, ideal total cholesterol is generally less than 200. Now, if you have other uh, comorbidities, meaning if you have heart disease and other types of uh, conditions, then you might want to bring your level even lower than 200. Mm -hmm. New guidelines are coming out every, uh, you know, a lot of the times, and there's changes in these, in these actual targets. So the, the latest guidelines that came out about cholesterol don't actually go look at particular targets, but there's a lot of debate about that, and they actually look at treatment for different 
uh, patient types of populations. So just keep that in mind, but for the most part, we still use these general numbers as ideal ranges for the cholesterol. So borderline high is going to be 201 to 239. The general number that people should keep in mind is that 200 number, because that's the total cholesterol. Then we talk about the bad cholesterol, which is the HDL cholesterol. The HDL cholesterol, the ideal range is less than 100. So remember, I told you what you'll see is the total number is 200, but these actual numbers will make up the different components of the cholesterol. Okay, so ideal for LDL cholesterol is less than 100. And I told you again, if you have other risk factors, if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, if you have heart disease, all these might change this number whereby you might want to even bring it down lower than 100. HDL cholesterol is the, is the actual good cholesterol, and that cholesterol you actually want to push to be as high as possible because I told you that's the better form of the cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So that you want to make as you know, greater than 60. Some people even have higher levels. So if you have a low level of your HDL cholesterol, that's actually considered a risk factor because this is the good cholesterol. So, I'm sorry, what makes the LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, bad? The, the way that the actual cholesterol is stored and what the LDL particle does is what makes it bad. So the LDL particle, for example, just to give everybody an idea, might actually take these, this cholesterol and deposit it in different blood vessels as opposed to taking it back and maybe get rid, getting rid of the extra cholesterol. The HDL is a particle which works in a different way, which actually will take the cholesterol and maybe digest it and get rid of it you know, in, in, in a type of way. So the actual particle itself is doing a lot in the body to deal with the cholesterol levels. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes it, you know, makes the difference between the different particles. And then the other one we didn't mention is the triglycerides. Triglycerides are more pure forms of actual fat in the blood. And those also you don't want to be very high. And I think uh, we, uh, we don't have the levels on here, but triglycerides you want to be generally less than 150. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that again makes up the total blood cholesterol level uh, when we talk about this. So what causes high cholesterol? So the cholesterol is related to many uh, different components, and the most common is, of course, how much you take in. Um, other factors that can include it, it you know, uh, in, include the actual levels and changes in the level is obesity and all these tie together. So your intake of cholesterol has a lot to do with how much the body uses it. Um, back in the day when we had a lot of cavemen and they would eat maybe once every you know, long period of time, the body was made to hold on to a lot of cholesterol because they would need it in order to go those long periods of time when, when we eat. So as part of the process where now we have you know, food always there and most of the time when we don't need it, we're snacking on something, the body then sees all of this cholesterol and says, well, listen, I have to do something with it. So it takes and it tries to store it in different areas. And the, the, path, the, the pathologic process of that or the bad process of that is where the body stores too much of it. And then our cholesterol levels rise and it deposits it in different parts of the body. And this is really the whole obesity process. And that leads to all kinds of different things like heart attacks, strokes, you know, increases in your blood pressure and, and all of those types of uh, situations. So what exams or tests are used to measure cholesterol? So very importantly, um, we always talk about when you go for your physical uh, exam, uh, a lot of what your physician will do is usually send blood tests. And part of the blood tests are generally fasting a blood test where you can measure your fasting levels of cholesterol in the body. Mm -hmm. And this will then measure your total cholesterol, which is the level that we talk about, but also will measure the bad cholesterol, the good cholesterol, as well as the triglycerides. So your, mm -hmm. your LDL, which is a low density lipoprotein, that's what the LDL stands for, and the HDL, which is the high density lipoprotein, and that's the good cholesterol that's that we talk about. And this can all be seen in a blood test, and we do it while fasting, because that gives us a baseline that should be uh, in a good range, because if you come after eating a heavy meal, your triglyceride levels are going to be high. So that's why we always do it on a fasting, empty stomach generally. And as far as testing goes, how often should one be tested? So it's really different for different people. It's always important to get a baseline. So as you go 
probably, you know, for your first physical or whatever, your physician will most likely send a cholesterol off. And then depending on what they find, so for example, if they find that you have a high level and they determine after diet and exercise and things like that, that you're going to need a medication, then you're going to need to follow that cholesterol level sequentially over time mm -hmm. to make sure that there's improvement in the cholesterol level. But if your cholesterol level is normal and say you're, you know, 20, 25 years old, then you don't necessarily have to measure it again. You, maybe you can do it every five years or depending on if you, know, if you become obese or if you're found to have high blood pressure, then you might want to measure it earlier. But in the case where everything is okay, you don't have to measure it very frequently. So more patient specific, depending on, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Amgad Macarius. We're gonna stop for a short break and we'll be right back with much more on the topic of cholesterol. Welcome back. We are back with Dr. Macarius, and we will be continuing our discussion on cholesterol. So what are some simple lifestyle changes that people can do in their diet to better control their cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So what we take in really affects our cholesterol level because it all depends on you know, how much fat and cholesterol content is within our diet. Mm -hmm. So in general, uh, there's recommendations uh, to have about five to seven times of healthy uh, foods in the diet, for example, fruits and vegetables. And the nice thing about the fruits and vegetables five is... Five to seven a day? Five to seven servings. Oh. Of, <laughs> and, you know, it could serving. be like a banana, it could be like a serving of, of, uh, of a fruit. So five to seven servings of these types of, um, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables during the day. So fruits and vegetables are good because they're, you know, generally low in cholesterol and the bad fats. And also they tend to have high protein levels, which will help in another way, they will help keep you satisfied, they'll keep you full, and thereby you won't rush and you know, have the other unhealthy snacks like potato chips and, and everything else. And what I'd like to show is an example of sort of what a healthy diet might include. And you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, so we'll show you guys, um, we'll show what, what a, uh, a healthy plate, if you will, looks oh. like. And this is actually from the Harvard School of Medicine. And what they allow us to do is they give us an idea for what the healthy parts of your diet would include. So I was mentioning to you, fruits and vegetables are always at the top of your list when it comes to, they're very good as snacks. They help fill you up. They're good in the morning. Um, and what they do is they actually have the healthy parts of the diet that we talk about. And the one thing to keep in mind is that some people think, well, French fry, that's a potato. So maybe that's part of the vegetable family or, or uh, things of that sort. But you got to remember that French fries are deep fried in oils, which are generally fried. bad <laughs> oils. Or fried. Um, fruits, the nice thing about fruits is all the different colored fruits. Berries are very healthy. Raspberries, strawberries. These are the types of uh, fruits which are actually very good for you because not only do they help satisfy you with a lot of the fiber in there, but they actually have good sugars in there as opposed to the people who worry about you know, diabetes. These are sugars that are more easily broken down by the body as opposed to the complex sugars which we find in sugary donuts and you know, all the other yes. bad things uh, in your body. Water actually is a big component, should be a big component of your body. Again, water is healthy for all the cells in the body. We can't survive. We can actually go for a couple of days without eating, but without water, we're not going to survive very long. So water, the other benefit of water is it, it will actually keep the body more full and satisfied. So some, some people will advocate actually drinking some water before going in to eat a heavy meal because your body will then, and your brain will feel that you're more satisfied as opposed to uh, you know, an empty stomach where you'll, you'll just eat more than you actually need. We also talk about the healthy oils. The more healthy oils are the oils like olive oil, canola oil, we talk now with less, less easy to find, but flaxseed oil, all these are the actual good oils that you should try to include more in your diet as opposed to the, the corn oils and the other oils which have the bad fats in them, okay? <laughs> and then... So replace, it's better when, when cooking or to replace it with olive or canola oil. Exactly. And those always make a difference. Cause... Exactly. 
And the other part of this that you see here are the actual whole grains. We talk about the different grains in the body, in, in, in foods. The processed white grains are actually not as good for you as the whole wheats and the whole, you know, the whole grains that you can actually uh, take. So whole grains are the whole wheats. Those you should try to increase in your body because again, these have the better carbohydrates for your body as opposed to the more, the more white and processed rices. Uh, rice also is another example. We have brown rice and we have white rice. The brown rices, which tend to be the more grains, the whole wheat grains and, and those types of grains are actually better for you than the white grain. So at a supermarket, go more for the whole wheat than the white bread. And there's also a whole wheat pasta, which is something Correct. that... Correct. So that's another example Good. of... So small changes here and there in your shopping can help in diet. Correct. And the last part of this, just to go through the rest of this plate, uh, is the proteins. We should always try to get good proteins as part of our diet because, again, the proteins will help fill you up. And, and if you're trying to lose weight, will keep you more satisfied for a longer period of time and help keep the pounds off. So you want to choose the good proteins that have a lot of the beneficial things like omega-3 omega fatty acids and all the positive things that we know will actually help decrease your cholesterol. So fish is very good with that. Poultry, chicken, uh, believe it or not, beans have a lot of protein in them. So uh, that's something to also keep in mind and try to limit a lot of the red meats because the red meats have the, the worst types of uh, proteins for you and they tend to be more full of fats and cholesterol. Mm. Uh, bacon is, is, is very bad also uh, for that kind of thing. So all these processed meats are the hot dogs. All these, all these types of processed meats are the types of meats that you want to try to avoid. All the delicious things. <laughs> yes, but again, anything in moderation, th this is the key is we're not, nobody's, uh, the person who tells you you can't eat this or you can't eat that, that's where you're going to fail with your diet. So the first rule of a good diet is actually indulging in some of the foods that you like, but in moderation. Never completely cut it out because then you'll feel like you're deprived and then you're going to go and try to sneak it in some other way. Right. So I know you mentioned also and touched over the fact about fruits. Um, Sometimes you do have, I want you to, you have the frozen fruits and you have fruits that are in the cups that are ready, and then you also have fresh fruits. So as far as that goes, should, is everything equal? Should I avoid certain fruits over the others? Should we just go for uh, the natural, which is always the best option, but at times you don't always, it's easier to just buy a fruit cup from the from the from the grocery store, right. and then have that, and then but you, but then you say, hey, I had fruits, mm -hmm. so so as a general rule of thumb, God's honest, you know, unprocessed food is the best food. That you yeah. never go wrong with that. However, there are healthy options. So you bring up a good point. We talk about some of these canned fruits where there's probably more sugar in there than there is fruit. And that's why that, oh that's what they use to make and them taste so good. And then you say so you good. had your fruit. And then you say you had your fruit. <laughs> and really what you've had is these canned fruits where they have this heavy syrup in there. So this, this gives you an example of the good fruits and vegetables to have and the bad ones that you shouldn't have. So the best ones are the fresh or even frozen vegetables are fine as long as they're the fresh frozen veg vegetables mm -hmm. that you can then thaw and eat. And, and this is, these are sometimes quicker to be able to get and they, they can maintain the freshness usually by freezing the fruit. So these are pretty good and, and good for you. The low sodium canned vegetables are usually pretty good too. And, okay. you know, we'll look at some of these, you know, an example of one of these labels that we talk about, but you should always look to make sure that they don't, they haven't added all the salt in there, number one, to preserve it and to make it taste better. So low sodium canned fruits can be acceptable. Again, not as good as the primary fresh produce that you can get, but it's something to be able to use. Canned fruit that is canned and, and put in the natural juices that come with the actual fruit, those are generally pretty good too, because in this case, they haven't added this heavy syrup and haven't added you know, all the preservatives and the sugar. So those you can find also a little bit harder to find and tend to be a little more expensive, but they go a long way when it comes to, uh, you know, more healthy type of eating. Fruits and vegetables you should try to avoid. So we talked about, obviously, French fries and deep fried, you know, uh, potatoes and things like that. But coconut is now, again, I'm not telling you to avoid it completely, but coconut tends to be heavy in fat and cholesterol. 
So that's something that if you're trying to, you know, limit those things, you should try to be a little bit careful with that. Again, vegetables with creamy sauces, fried or breaded vegetables, you know, sometimes, you know, they'll fry things and all it before you know it, it's, you're defeating the purpose of the, the puzzle. Canned fruits and heavy syrup we talked about, and then frozen fruits where they add a whole bunch of sugar to make it taste better. All of these are, are types of things that really defeats the healthy purpose. Now, salads is another thing. This is a big misconception that everybody has. They buy a salad, which is good, and then they douse it with all this, you know, dressing. ranch sal <laughs> salad dressing and everything else. And before you know it, you're actually getting more calories in that salad than you would if you had a Big Mac or some other, you know, heavy duty, uh, you know, burger or whatever it is. Yeah. So always be careful. You know, we fool ourselves and people will, will tend to sometimes buy diet foods. And then before you know it, they're eating three or four packages of diet food, which is worse than if you had eaten the full non-diet uh, food. So always be careful. Always pay attention to uh, different things uh, when it comes to what you're picking. Mm. So at many times when you're shopping and you're in the grocery store and you're walking down the aisle, and you're picking out, um, you're choosing between, you know, should I get this, should I get this? You know, you tend to pick up the box, whether it's like cereal or, um, I don't know, any snacks, chips, cookies, and you always tend to look at the, the back, mm -hmm. where it says serving size, and it says, what should I be looking for when I'm, ta when I'm in the grocery store and I'm about to buy something, and what that like red flag that should tell me, you know, be careful, maybe you shouldn't, maybe you should put that down and go for, the, go for this instead. So that's very important. And, and, you know, there are requirements that all food products need to have this, the classic label that everybody's familiar with, which is called the nutrition facts label. Now, this label can sometimes get confusing because depending on different things on here, you might actually get confused and think it's more healthy than it really is. So some of the important things, and I won't go through all the different numbers, but some of the important things to keep in mind, the number one thing you should look at is the serving size. Because mm -hmm. this is something that, depending on you know, what, what you look at, they can try to play games with what the actual serving size is. So sometimes they'll say, you know, the serving size is, you know, two pieces of what's in the bag. And before you know it, you're not paying attention to it and you eat the whole bag. And you might think, oh, well, you know, it's low calories or it's low this, but it's actually not because you're eating the whole bag, which might include four or five serving sizes. This happens to be a Doritos bag, which um, we happen to have handy here. So we'll, we'll use this as an example. This, they actually nicely made it, made it easy for us. So they said the serving size is actually one package. So okay. when they talk about things here, they're saying the whole bag is going to include what we're going to talk about. So the serving size is one package. Servings per container, that's the next thing they tell you about. They'll tell you how many servings are in the bag. So since the serving size is one package, there's one serving per container. So that makes sense. Okay. So here it's easy, okay? We don't have to worry. But that's the first thing your eye should always go to is make sure that what you're looking at is the actual size, okay? Next thing you want to look at is the calories. You see here, that's usually the next thing. And it says amount per serving, okay? So this bag will contain this number of calories. If you eat all the chips in this bag, you will get 140 calories, okay? So we'll just talk about, imagine myself just to on give, the treadmill. give yourself an idea <laughs> of, that's, that's a perfect example. We'll talk about that in a second. So 140 calories. Then they'll start talking about a whole bunch of other things. They'll tell you calories from fat is, and is 70. And what I will tell you is a calorie is a calorie, okay? Of course, if it's a calorie from fat, it might be a little bit worse for you because you're deriving that the body might not be able to deal with more fat. But a calorie is a calorie, okay? If you're trying to lose weight, you need to limit the amount of calories in your diet. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to decrease bad cholesterol and things like that, then you have to pay a little bit more of attention to the fat. But you'd be amazed that for a lot of people, and you know, in New York City, they talk about every restaurant they have to list, and every deli and places you go into, they have to list the amount of calories in the foods you eat. You'd be amazed by the amount of weight you can lose and a healthier diet that just having the knowledge of what you're eating will help with. Okay, so that's why it's very important to look at these. Okay, so that's the calories. Next, they go through a whole bunch of different things, and this part is usually different for different products because some products might have salt, others might not, others might have you know certain kinds of fats and not. 
let's look at this one. Total fat. This is the total amount of fat in the actual uh, you know, container of the food. But we know that there are different kinds of fat. There's saturated fat, there are trans fats, there's unsaturated fats. In general, the saturated fats are the worst fats for you. The baddest fats that you can ever have are the trans fats. So anytime you see trans fats, that you know is, is a bad thing. Luckily, they're being taken out of a lot of the foods. The trans fats are the most processed of foods. Other names for trans fats are partially hydrogenated fats where they do all these funny chemical reactions to give better taste and flavor to the actual product. But again, the furthest you go away from God's product, which is natural fat, the worse it gets for you. Processed foods are bad. Okay? So trans fats, luckily this has zero. Okay, so that's, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Areas where you have trans fats are, you know, some of the, the classic, you know, movie popcorn, where all that butter that they put on there, those tend to have a lot of trans fats. Some other things, you know, can have trans fats as well, but that's the classic example. Then we go into cholesterol. Now you might say, look, cholesterol is 0%. There's no cholesterol here. Well, that's great. Well, it is, but you're still getting fat. And we just got finished saying that the body converts fat into cholesterol. So even though there's no cholesterol in this product, there's, there's a good amount of fat here, 8 grams. And on the side here, they'll give you the percent of your daily value, which means based on a, about a 2,000 calorie diet, they'll tell you whether or not you're getting you know, whatever it is you should based on that. So 8 grams of total fat gives you 12% of your daily diet around. Just okay. from like a small so, bag of chips. Just from a small bag of <laughs> chips, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. And then they talk about sodium and other things, but without getting into too much detail, pay attention to what it says here, um, and you'll really go a long way. Just by looking at the calories themselves, you'll be able to compare things. Wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> that, was, um, that, was a good, um, that was a good review. So shifting gears back to cholesterol, and we're going to focus now on the pharmaceutical world of cholesterol. What are um, different classes of drugs or so that are used to treat cholesterol? Okay, so the classic medications that we use, the first thing that we always prescribe is diet control. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just because somebody comes in and their cholesterol is mildly elevated doesn't mean they're automatically gonna go home from the doctor's office with a medication. So always, diet is always the, the, the beginning. Now, if somebody's cholesterol is really elevated and you're worried for them at risk, then you might actually put them on a cholesterol medication right away. But just because you're on a cholesterol medication doesn't take away the need of still watching your diet. Some people will, will mistake in that and say, well, you know, I'm on a medication and I can eat whatever I want. Not okay. true, okay? Because the medications alone will not be able to control it if you're not eating the proper medication, uh, the proper foods. Mm -hmm. So classic class of medications are the statins. We all talk about you know, the statins. We see commercials on the TV about Lipitor and other statin medications. These are the, the, really the main class of medications that we use to control your cholesterol levels. And depending on your level, you'll, get, you'll have a target uh, dose that you will uh, aim for for a particular patient mm -hmm. in order to bring the cholesterol down. Other classes of medications are niacin, for example. Is, uh, everybody thinks of niacin as actually a vitamin, but niacin and a higher dose will actually help bring your cholesterol down. Of course, there are side effects associated with it, right. but niacin is another way. There are some older medic medications, the fibric acid derivative medications, where, which can also decrease. Those tend to work a little bit better on the triglyceride mm -hmm. uh, part of the cholesterol. Um, and, the, and they can bring the triglycerides down. So all these types of medications taken together can help uh, bring your, um, you know, you might not necessarily put people on, the, on multiple classes of these medications, but certain medications can help bring your cholesterol down to where you need it to be. Mm. And um, what would you say are some long-term effects of usage with statins, for example, uh, atorvastatin, which is Lipitor, or simvastatin, which is Zocor? Right, so along with um, you know, checking your cholesterol, you need to check other blood tests because these medications generally work on the liver. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So some of the side effects that can happen is they can damage uh, the liver and cause issues with that. So your doctor will do screening blood tests to make sure that all these things are okay, along with checking the actual cholesterol. Other side effects associated with statins, you hear about muscle pains. A lot of people will get muscle pains when it comes to the statin medications. And this is a known side effect. And a lot of times we actually tell patients to put up with it for a while and the, this side effect will get better because we know there's a major positive effect with decreasing your blood pressure, uh, your uh, cholesterol with, this, uh, with these medications. So that will help in that way. So again, depending on how bad the symptoms are, uh, you speak with your doctor and you discuss and, and you figure out the best course of action. Now, would you say there's over-the-counter products that can be taken to help lower someone's cholesterol? Okay, so th there are some over-the-counter, um, um, for example, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, these are, you'll see sometimes in the vitamin aisle, um, and these are also felt to be uh, the types of things that can help bring down your cholesterol. We talked about fish. These uh, omega-3 fatty acids tend to be in fish. So if you wanted a natural way of getting these omega-3 fatty acids, you can eat fish, and that will help get it to you. If you don't if you're not such a fan of fish, then you can actually try to, you can buy them uh, in the store over the counter. Some people have advocated garlic. You know, you have these garlic pills that can help with your cholesterol. A lot of these things can help, uh, but if you're at the level where, you know, you really need stronger medications, these medications won't always, these over-the-counter types of drugs will not always be able to get you to the range that you need to be. Thank you so much again, Dr. Amgad. Pleasure to have you. Thank you for answering all of our questions. Thank you for the nutritional facts, enlightenment. <laughs> um, I hope we all just become a little bit more cautious because the products you buy in the, in the grocery store mean so much because you're bringing it home and you're gonna end up eating it. So when you do that first step of buying the right product, you end up putting in what's more healthier for you. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed our episode today, and we hope we answered many of your questions. Until next time, have a blessed day.